Hey friends, welcome back to my kitchen. And if you are new to See Mini Mom, I'm very glad that you are joining me today. I'm going to be sharing with you a video that's all about saving time, maybe getting a little bit ahead of the game in our kitchens when we are making meals for our family system. is cook once, eat twice, or more. And what I am doing with these recipes is not just, hey, let's double the recipe and then freeze half of it for a meal down the road, although that is not a bad strategy at all. I'm trying to share some ideas for how we can take something that we make, make a little extra, and then turn it into something different in subsequent meals. I personally think that this is also a great way to save a little money because we can take an ingredient, like a meat ingredient, and we can use it in a different way in different recipes, like maybe as a garnish instead of the main event for the meal and that way we can stretch it across multiple recipes. Before we dive in, I hope that you will hit that thumbs up. It helps me appease the algorithm. And if you like what you see here and you have not already subscribed, I would love it if you hit that subscribe button. We are getting so close to 100,000 subscribers, you guys. I'm so excited. I have you to thank for all of the amazing things that are happening here on See Mindy Mom. So if you wanna stick around, make sure you're hitting that subscribe button and click that little notification bell so that you know when new videos are coming out. Okay, we're gonna make this super easy. I have my salmon fillets here, and these are pretty big, so my kids will probably each only eat half of one, and then I will probably eat one, my husband will eat one, and then we'll have a couple left over to make salads out of. You could do more if you wanted to. I just went ahead and used up all the salmon that I had in that package. I'm gonna sprinkle just a little bit of salt. My oven is preheating to 400, <laughs> so it was letting me know that it's done. I'm gonna sprinkle just a little bit of salt and a little bit of pepper on top of these. Now in this bowl, I have about two tablespoons of butter, which I melted, half a cup of Parmesan cheese. These are Italian seasoned breadcrumbs. And if you don't have Italian seasoned breadcrumbs, you could just add like a teaspoon of Italian seasoning to this mixture. You just wanna use plain breadcrumbs. I'm gonna mix that around and kind of make kind of like a crumbly topping that I'm going to press into the tops of these because I'm kind of hoping for sort of a Parmesan crusted type style of salmon filet here. That's what I'm going for. And I'm just going to place a little bit of this on top of each one of the filets here. And then I'm just gonna kind of pat that down and kind of press it into the salmon like this. And then to finish it off, I'm just gonna drizzle just a little bit of olive oil on the salmon filets. And then I'm gonna use this little pastry brush right here to just sort of gently kind of try to, try to brush that around a little bit, just to kind of help the breadcrumbs set there on top. So the salmon fillets need to cook at 400 to an internal temperature of at least 145. My research tells me that that usually takes anywhere, you know, right around 15 minutes or so. So I'm actually gonna check them just a few minutes before. I do have a meat thermometer. I have a digital thermometer that I use whenever I'm making stuff like this. I use it a lot with chicken also because I always wanna make sure that that's completely done. But I will use that and check the temperature here in about 12 or 13 minutes and see where we're at. I have in my pot here about two tablespoons of butter and probably the equivalent of about four cloves of garlic. I melted the butter and I've let the garlic saute on its own for about two minutes. And now I'm going to add about one and a half cups of rice. I'm gonna use this basmati rice right here. I'm gonna let the rice brown for about one to two minutes or so. Now I'm just gonna add about three cups of water. And I'm gonna use about two teaspoons of this better than bouillon broth base here. Since I'm not using chicken broth, I'm just using water. I'm going to bring this to a boil, reduce the heat, cover it. I'm gonna let it simmer for about 10 to 12 minutes. And then I'm gonna turn the heat completely off, but leave the lid on so that the rice will finish cooking by steaming. leftover salmon to make some really delicious salads for lunch. And I'm going to make a homemade dressing. It's going to be a champagne vinaigrette and it calls for a special type of vinegar, a champagne vinegar. I actually found this at my Whole Foods. Normally I am not a proponent of buying specialty ingredients like this because I feel like I might use it for just one recipe and then they just kind of hang around my kitchen and maybe go bad or maybe I end up throwing them out eventually because I just never use them. However, with vinegar, it has a pretty long shelf 
shelf life. And my husband specifically asked me to find a recipe for this dressing and I was so grateful because normally he does not like vinaigrettes, but I love them. So there's a salad at a restaurant that we go to occasionally called Red Rock Canyon. And that salad has a champagne vinaigrette and my husband really, really likes that salad. So he asked me if I would figure out if I can make a dressing that's similar to that. So I was like, yes, I will see if I can figure that out. So if he likes it, not only will this you know, come in handy today. I know that I will be able to make that dressing again for salads in the future. And again, since vinegar is probably not gonna go bad very quickly, I know that I will probably use this up. I'm using a recipe from a website called Five Heart Home, and I will leave it linked in the description box below. But I'm going to be using half a cup of olive oil, a quarter cup of the champagne vinegar, the juice from half a lemon, which I will squeeze, one tablespoon of Dijon mustard, and one tablespoon of honey. And the Dijon mustard, that's a common ingredient in vinaigrettes because this acts as a emulsifier for the oil and the, the vinegar. It helps kind of keep it together. I'm going to use about a teaspoon of this minced garlic. It calls for one clove of garlic minced and then salt and pepper to taste. Today's video is sponsored by ButcherBox, and I am delighted to be working with ButcherBox again. I have actually been a ButcherBox customer for almost two years now, since before actually they were a sponsor of my channel. ButcherBox delivers high quality meat right to your doorstep, including 100% grass-fed beef, free-range organic chicken, humanely raised pork, and wild-caught seafood, like the salmon that you've already seen featured in this video, which was wild-caught in Bristol Bay, Alaska. ButcherBox does offer a variety of different boxes whenever you are placing your order. So there are options for different kinds and cuts of meat, options for different delivery frequencies. You can even cancel at any time with no penalty. I don't know about you guys, but I am seeing a lot of inconsistency where stock is concerned in the meat sections at my grocery store. So being able to go to the butcher box website and pick out exactly the cuts that I want and then know that they are going to be delivered to my doorstep and have a general idea of when it is coming makes it a little bit easier for me to meal plan. Butcher box does have a deal for new members today. When you follow the link in the description box below, new members are going to get free ground beef for life. That means that as long as you have your membership, if you sign up today, you are going to get two pounds of grass-fed ground beef in addition to all of the other things that you are normally getting in your boxes. This is the same deal that I got when I signed up with Butcher Box almost two years ago. So when they say free ground beef for life, they mean it because that's a deal that we have been enjoying for two years now. You are actually seeing in this video three of my favorite things to order from Butcher Box that I think are the best value, the bone and pork shoulder the salmon fillets, and also the organic chicken breast. But make sure that you have a look around their website and don't forget to check out their specials because they often have special prices, special deals, or special cuts of meat that change from time to time and you can get some really good deals that you can add onto your box that you're already ordering. So thank you again to ButcherBox for sponsoring today's video and don't forget to check out the link in the description box. New members will get free ground beef for the life of their membership. Whenever I get a butcher box, I always request this item. I always ask for this item in my box. It is, in my opinion, the best value item that ButcherBox offers, and that is a bone-in pork shoulder roast, sometimes called a pork butt, a bone-in. And I know it might seem odd because obviously some of what you're paying for or what you're getting is the bone, but the bone comes in handy for things too. I can make broth with it as well, and I really feel like it enhances the flavor of this, which I always make in the slow cooker. With the bone-in pork shoulder roast, you're guaranteed five and a half pounds. This one is actually closer to six. I've received some 
some that are as large as seven pounds. And this isn't just a cook once, eat twice item for us. This usually makes three, if not four, sometimes five meals for us, depending on how I use it across multiple meals. I always make it in the slow cooker. The recipe I use is from a website called Kevin and Amanda, and I will be sure to leave it linked in the description box. But I think that the key to this is brining the pork shoulder. So it's one of those things that you kind of have to plan ahead as far as making it because it needs to brine for anywhere from 24 to 48 hours before you cook it. I know this may seem kind of odd, but to store this in the refrigerator while I brine it, I usually use this huge pitcher. This is like a four quart, yeah, one gallon plastic pitcher because then I can pop the lid on it and turn it and that way if it gets bumped, it's not like sloshing around in there. You could also put it in a Ziploc bag. If I do that, I make sure that it's also sitting inside another dish because I do have to put this in the refrigerator while it brines. But what I will do is just take this pitcher, I will put the pork roast in the pitcher and then I will add the salt and the water. And the original recipe calls for adding some of the spice rub that you use with it. I don't do that. I just brine it with salt water. And also I either use about two teaspoons of table salt or pink salt or one tablespoon of kosher salt. I don't use as much salt, I think, as the original brining recipe calls for. I've played around with different amounts of salt in the brine, and that's just kind of what I've landed on that makes it taste the way that we like. So you might have to err on the side of caution and use a little less salt at first, and then every time you make it, you can kind of bump it up until it gets to the point that you want it to be at, <laughs> until it gets to the saltiness that you need it to be at. Good morning, everybody. It is me, sans makeup, because <laughs> I haven't finished getting ready yet, but it's time to get this pork roast going in the crock pot. It is a little after seven. My pork shoulder has been brining in the refrigerator for almost 24 hours. So I've got it here in the crock pot and we're gonna get it going in the slow cooker. My pork shoulder is here in the crock pot. It was really easy to drain from that pitcher because I just basically turned the lid so that I could pour the liquids directly down the drain and then I have it here. And to make the spice rub, I will leave the original recipe, like I said, linked in the description box below, but I kind of have it mixed the way that we like it. And for us, I use half a cup of brown sugar, one tablespoon each of chili powder, garlic powder, and onion powder, two teaspoons each of cumin and paprika, and then one teaspoon of salt. I leave the cayenne that it calls for out because the children don't like it super duper spicy, but you certainly could put some cayenne pepper in here if you want. And now I'm just gonna rub that into the pork shoulder, and then I'm gonna flip it over and I'm gonna rub it in on the other side as well. You want the fat side of the roast to be on the top here because it will render some of the juices as it cooks and it will make this really, really flavorful. You actually don't need any liquid here in the crock pot because it's going to render so much as it cooks. So now I am just going to put the lid on this and pop it into my crock pot and I'm gonna let it cook low and slow all day. It's probably gonna cook for about 10 or 11 hours on low and you're gonna see how delicious and amazing it looks. It's gonna fall right off the bone. My roast has been cooking on low for about 10 solid hours now. And I just wanted to show you guys what it looks like now. So you can see, look at all the juices that it rendered. So that's why I don't ever add like any water or broth or anything to this. But I'm just gonna remove the fatty layer that's on top here. And now look at how easily this shreds up. I mean, it just basically falls apart, just like that. It just falls right off the bone. So I'm just gonna go ahead and shred it up. I'm gonna remove the bone. I'll let that cool off and then I'll pop it into a baggie and just store it in the freezer so that I can have it for another time when I wanna make some broth. I absolutely love this recipe because not only does it make really tender, flavorful, delicious pork shoulder, it also produces so much meat that I can usually get three if not four meals out of this one roast for my family. Especially if I'm thinking about in subsequent meals after the first time we eat it, using it in a way that it's more like a garnish or that it's flavoring a dish and adding lots of starches and vegetables and things like that to kind of bulk the dish up. I have used the leftover meat before to make sandwiches, to make sliders, to make quesadillas or tacos, to make burrito bowls. We've used it to make nachos. We've eaten it on top of baked potatoes. I've even made some pasta dishes with it. I'm so hungry, you guys, that I almost forgot to show you the finished product. We had a lacrosse practice creep up on us. I had forgotten that McKenna was supposed to go to her first lacrosse practice tonight. So I had to take her to that which meant that I did not have time to make mashed potatoes. So instead we're having baked potatoes because I could throw those into the oven um, before we left the house for lacrosse practice, which I have to admit, I know nothing about lacrosse. So it'll be um, learning time for all of us. But here is the pork. 
I have some green beans here. I made these from fresh green beans. I just boiled them on the stove and then I added some Parmesan cheese and some breadcrumbs, salt and pepper, and then just baked potato with some cheese and sour cream. This will be dinner tonight. And we have plenty of this left over to make some more meals from, and I will give you some more ideas for that. Tonight, I am going to use the leftover pulled pork to make a barbecue pulled pork pizza. It's actually one of my favorite things to do with the leftover pulled pork. I'll show you exactly how I do it. Of course, you can you know change it up according to what your tastes and preferences are. I'm going to make the crust from scratch. I use the recipe from My Busy Kitchen. I will leave it linked in the description box below. It's a take on the two ingredient dough recipe that just uses self-rising flour and Greek yogurt, but she actually adds yeast to it and a little bit of water so it makes like a fluffier pizza crust. You can use whatever crust you want. If you have a homemade version that you like, if you have a store-bought version that you like, if you want to buy one that's already made or one that like comes in the can, I think Pillsbury makes one, you can do that. It's just up to you whatever crust you like. This is just the one that we like to use. These are the other things I'm gonna use to make my pizza. I have some of my pulled pork from last night. I have a can of pineapple chunks, which I will drain. Some barbecue sauce. This is actually some shredded Monterey Jack. This is a 16 ounce block. I don't know if I'll need all of that. I went ahead and shredded all of it up. And then I have a little bit of red onion here. So I just put the crust in the oven to par bake for a few minutes before I add the toppings on. I just find that that works best with this kind of pizza. The crust really needs more time than the toppings do to reheat. So I like to give it a head start. And I am preheating my oven to 400. It's not quite there yet, but I went ahead and put the crust in. So I'll leave that in there for about five minutes and then we'll put the toppings on. Okay, my crust is cooked a little bit. So now we're gonna put together the pizza and it's super, super easy. You can use any kind of barbecue sauce you want. This is just what happened to be in the refrigerator. <laughs> now I'm going to put on a little bit of red onion and I put this underneath because I feel like it adds a lot of flavor and the people who say they don't like red onion, they really do like it as long as I hide it in the pizza. Now a little bit of cheese and I'm using Monterey Jack like I said, but you can use a different kind of cheese if you want. I feel like this goes really well with the pork. I mean, it almost gives it kind of like a Southwest style flavor. And since I'm using barbecue sauce anyway, I feel like that, you know, complements it really well. Now my pork, and I'm just going to kind of make sure that that is shredded up a little bit. You can warm this up in the microwave if you want to, if it's kind of stuck together. That kind of helps it separate a little bit better. And by the way, I still have plenty of this left as well as what's in this bowl so that I can make other meals. We're definitely gonna get three if not four meals out of this. And now for the super controversial topping, pineapple. I actually think that it complements this style of pizza really well. So I'm going to put some on, but I'm only going to put it on half of the pizza because I have some people who have decided that they just can't handle pineapple on any kind of pizza. So it's only going on half, but trust me, if you haven't tried it, because I balked at it for years and years, and then I finally tried it, it's really good on this kind of pizza. And I like to finish this off with just a little bit more cheese because I feel like that kind of helps the topping stick, you know, to the rest of the pizza. Okay, I'm gonna pop this back into the oven for about 10 minutes or so, and we will be ready to eat it. Okay, here it is. This is the final product. And I just took the easy route tonight and I just have a little fruit to go along with this, but super easy, super tasty meal. And I still have plenty of that pulled pork left to make other meals with as well. This next recipe, I've actually had something like it pinned on my Pinterest board for a while. I thought it was a really interesting take on like a chicken and noodles. It's a chicken and noodle bake, but it's not, you know, what you would think of when you think of chicken and noodles. So I've wanted to try it for a while, but I've not gotten around to it because I feel like the original recipe at least would make a lot. It would make a lot of chicken and noodles. It would probably, in my opinion, feed six to eight people, a pretty hefty size portion. And I just don't usually need meals that size for the season of life that we're in with our family. But I have an idea for how I can utilize the other half of the recipe that we may not need tonight and save myself some time down the road. You'll see what I'm talking about. So let me show you what I'm using to make this. I am starting with some cooked 
chicken breast. And I actually just made mine in the crock pot. Whenever I need cooked chicken breast, and I know ahead of time, I will usually do it that way because it's super easy. I just threw about two pounds of chicken breast into the crock pot, salt and pepper, a little Italian seasoning. I cooked mine on high for around four hours. They would also cook on low for um, six to seven hours, depending on your crock pot. And then I just shredded it up so I have it here. If you wanted to use some rotisserie chicken, some canned chicken, if you have like some leftover, maybe grilled chicken, as long as it doesn't have really strong flavors, that should work as well. I have six tablespoons of butter divided, four tablespoons and two tablespoons, one 24 ounce container of small curd cottage cheese, one egg, a quarter cup of flour, two and a half cups of chicken broth. I'm going to season this with a teaspoon of Italian seasoning, a teaspoon of garlic powder, and then salt and pepper to taste. I have one 16 ounce package of egg noodles, and I have one package of mixed vegetables. I would have preferred just to use peas and carrots, but my grocery store is out of them. And the original recipe doesn't call for any veggies. I'm just throwing them in because I think it'll work and it'll add some vegetables to this dish. And then the original recipe calls for mozzarella for two cups of mozzarella. Unfortunately, I don't have any. I thought that I did, but I don't. So this is actually two cups or an eight ounce block that I shredded of Colby Jack. So hopefully that will work. Hopefully that will still taste good. I can't imagine that it wouldn't because we love cheese in this house. I'm also going to add a little breadcrumb topping to this as well. So I'm gonna use about a half a cup of these seasoned breadcrumbs. You'll see how here in a little bit. On the stove here, I have my four tablespoons of butter and I have my package of frozen mixed veggies. I'm just letting the butter melt and the veggies kind of defrost a little bit together. And I also have a big pot of water right here that is coming to a boil. And as soon as it comes to a boil, I will add my entire one pound package of egg noodles, but I'm only going to let those cook for about four to five minutes. I don't want them to cook all the way because they're gonna have plenty of time to finish cooking whenever we reheat this whole dish together. I'm gonna go ahead and sprinkle in my flour. And I'm also going to add my seasonings, teaspoon of garlic powder, teaspoon of Italian seasoning, salt and pepper to taste. I'm probably just adding about half a teaspoon of salt and several cracks of black pepper. I'm also gonna add my broth base because I'm just using water and broth base instead of using chicken broth. If you're using chicken broth or veggie broth or whatever, you can skip this. You don't need any bouillon or broth base. I'm just gonna stir that around and kind of let the flour soak up the butter. I'm gonna turn my heat down. I'm gonna slowly stir in the water. This is where you would be adding chicken broth if you're not using broth base or bouillon like I do. You stir that in. I'm gonna let it come up to a simmer. I need to combine all of the cheeses with the egg. So I'm just going to go ahead and dump this entire carton of cottage cheese in here. I'm gonna put my egg in and most of my shredded cheese, I'm gonna use about three quarters of it in this mixture and I'm gonna leave just a little bit so that I can sprinkle it over the top of the casserole. Just stir that all together and it will be ready to add into the sauce that we're making here in a little bit. My sauce has been simmering for a couple minutes. You can see that it's starting to kind of thicken up in there. It smells really fragrant. So we're gonna go ahead and add the cheese mixture to this and stir it and let it simmer together for a few minutes while the noodles are finishing par cooking and then we'll be ready to put this together. Stir, stir, stir. I drained my noodles and I put them right back here in this pot and then I poured the sauce that I've been making in my Dutch oven over the top because I knew that my five quart Dutch oven would not be big enough for this recipe. Remember, this is a lot, this makes a lot. So my noodles are there, the sauce that I was making is there and now I'm gonna add my chicken and then we're just going to stir all of that together. So my stove is off. I'm just stirring this together. We're gonna finish this up in the oven, so I'm not worried about anything cooking anymore. Of course, everything is pretty much fully cooked in here. The noodles are a little bit undercooked, but that's what we want. Just gonna stir this to combine, and we'll finish it up. Half of what was in my pot here, my stock pot, when I was mixing it all together, is now in my casserole dish. This is just kind of your standard nine by 13 casserole dish. And I am going to sprinkle the rest of the cheese over the top of this. And then I made a breadcrumb topping by melting the other two tablespoons of butter and then adding about half a cup of these breadcrumbs. And I just kind of stirred it all around with my fork here until it is crumbly. And I am just going to sprinkle that over the top of the entire casserole. And now I'm just going to pop this in the oven at 350. My oven has been preheating, so it's ready to go. And all it has to do is kind of reheat through until it's all bubbly. It'll probably take about 25 minutes. So you could at this point 
put the other half that we have not used of the noodle mixture into like a foil pan and cover it with saran wrap with foil, you know, seal it up nice and tightly and pop it into your freezer so you could maybe thaw that out and reheat it later on for another family meal. But I'm actually going to do something a little bit different. You guys know if you watch my channel that I sometimes like to freeze individual portions of things, especially leftovers for lunches down the road for me, my husband, our oldest daughter who likes to heat up things to take in her thermos for lunch at school. So that's actually what I'm going to do with the rest of this recipe. I'm going to make some little individual meals and it's another reason why I par cooked the noodles. I didn't cook them all the way because we're going to reheat these meals in the microwave and the noodles will finish cooking while it's reheating and it'll keep them from getting all mushy whenever we reheat them. smells really good. It's still hot. <laughs> just came out of the oven. Mm. Oh yeah, that's really good. This is great. But let me just double check. Mm. What I love about that is that it's not like super saucy. You know how some noodle casseroles are like really, really saucy? There's just enough in there for good flavor, but it's not like soupy. You know what I mean? It's really good. Mmm. Definitely a keeper. I have another taste tester here. He wants to, he wants to try it out. I love it. <laughs> oh, you love it? There you have it. Rick, do you give it one thumbs up or two thumbs up? Um, three. Three thumbs up? Mm -hmm. High praise indeed. That's what I have for you guys today. Thank you so much for watching and be sure to visit the link in the description box below. When you sign up for ButcherBox for the first time, you are going to get free ground beef for life. So be sure to visit that link in the description box below to check out ButcherBox, what they have to offer and snag that deal. See you guys with another video real soon.